Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome. My name is Andrew Gustafson, uh, and apologies uh, about the sun behind me. We're going to move around a little bit so we won't have the sun in our eyes the whole time. Um, but welcome to the Brooklyn Navy Yard. Um, so I'm from Turnstile Tours. Uh, some of you may have joined us uh, earlier in the day as we were a little bit further down the waterfront um, in uh, uh, Sunset Park, um, but now we are at the Navy Yard and we're gonna do a little exploration here um, of dry dock number one, uh, which is what you see behind me right here. So this is one of the most uh, historic uh, sites of the Brooklyn Navy Yard. You'll see we're wobbling a little bit because we have a little bit of wind here uh, as well as we're sitting right on the wall of that bay. Um, but dry dock number one is one of the oldest structures at the Brooklyn Navy Yard. Um, and it's one that is still in use today as a ship repair facility. Now, it kind of just looks like a hole in the ground right now because we uh, don't have any ships being repaired, but we do have them uh, under repair at other parts of the shipyard uh, that we're going to take a look at um, in just a minute. Um, so before we dive in, I just wanted to uh, thank everybody who's joining us on Facebook. Uh, so if you have any questions, you can drop them uh, into the uh, into the uh, comments. Uh, and um, Cindy uh, is behind the scenes helping produce uh, and she's going to pass those questions along to me. She's also going to be pulling up some historical images that we can uh, look at as well um, to learn a little bit more um, about the history of, of dry dock number one. Um, I also just want to mention, uh, you know, give a big thanks uh, to our friends at Open House New York uh, for putting on this incredible weekend um, despite the fact that we can't actually go out and be together in these places. Um, Open House New York is really one of those days um, that, you know, we mark on the calendar every year. Uh, and it's really a, a time when we get to see uh, so many people um, that maybe we'll just see once a year at Open House New York at the, at the great events. So uh, we're not able to convene together like we are normally, um, but I just want to give a big shout out um, to the whole team at OHNY for making this virtual digital convening uh, happen. So uh, this, is, this is really special and we're so happy to be a part of um, the programming today. Um, okay, we'll give people just a, a couple more moments uh, to continue uh, to join us. Um, a little bit about the Brooklyn Navy Yard, because uh, I know we have people joining us from all over the country and all over the world. So what is this place? So the Brooklyn Navy Yard was established uh, in 1801 uh, as a federal shipbuilding and ship repair facility. Um, and so this was a federal shipyard from 1801 up until 1966. You can see an aerial photo here uh, of, the, uh, of the 300 acre campus. Um, the shape that the Navy Yard has today is really the shape that it took in World War II, which was the peak of operations here, about 72,000 people uh, working at the yard, um, making it arguably the busiest shipyard in the entire world. And a lot of the infrastructure we have here uh, dates back to the Second World War. Um, so that's the peak of operations. Um, in 1966, the federal government decides to shut it down uh, and they sell the property to the city of New York. So today, the whole uh, Navy Yard is owned by the city of New York and run by the nonprofit Brooklyn Navy Yard Development Corporation. Uh, and so their mission is to use this site to create good quality jobs for local people in industry, manufacturing, uh, creative industries, um, but really the focus is on quality jobs um, and creating those uh, middle-class jobs as well. So we have about 450 businesses that operate in the Navy Yard today uh, and about 11,000 people uh, work here. Um, among the people that work here are the people that work in the shipyard. So we do still have a working shipyard. We're not building ships anymore like we were in the Navy days, uh, but we are still repairing them. And this is still actually the largest ship repair facility in New York Harbor. Um, so the three dry docks that we have operating here are absolutely critical uh, to the operation of the port. So Cindy just pulled up a map here um, and you can see where we're standing um, at dry dock number one. So it's the westernmost dry dock. Uh, you'll see that there are numbers one through six here. I mentioned that there are three working dry docks today. Uh, two, three, and four are no longer functioning, but one, five, and six um, do still work. Um, and we'll talk about what kind of work uh, they do in those dry docks uh, 
uh, what they do in those dry docks today. Uh, just to give you a little, a little plug to uh, the map that Cindy just pulled up. Uh, that's actually a map that we made for Open House New York. So again, the Brooklyn Navy Yard is normally an extremely popular destination. I think last year we had 50 or 60 um, different artists and manufacturers that participated in Open House New York and, and threw their doors open. Um, so we, we can't do that this year, obviously, but we created uh, this map resource instead where you can take a walk around the perimeter of the yard and check out uh, some of the public spaces that are accessible around the perimeter, but also uh, check out some of the neighborhoods and learn about some of the history uh, because a lot of the Navy Yard's history spills out uh, beyond its fences across Flushing Avenue and into neighborhoods like Williamsburg and Fort Greene and Clinton Hill and Vinegar Hill. Um, so you can find that on our website. Um, if you go to turnstiletours.com slash OHNY, uh, you can find all of our live programs, our recorded programs, as well as these map resources uh, that we've made. Uh, okay, so just get a quick check in. Cindy, do we have any questions so far? Okay, so we're gonna keep going. Um, so first question, what is a dry dock? Um, well, there are a few different types of dry docks. Uh, technically, what is behind me here is called a graving dock. Um, so a dry dock uh, is basically a, a facility that you use to get a ship out of the water. Um, ships are really big and heavy. Uh, once they're in the water, you usually can't just lift them out. So you need some kind of mechanism uh, that can do that. Now, there are two main types. Uh, one is called a graving dock. Um, which we'll talk about in just a minute. Uh, the other is called a floating dry dock. And so a floating dry dock is basically a type of modified barge. Uh, and if we can pull up some images here. Um, so prior to the advent of dry docks, uh, if you look at this image along the top, and I wanna give a shout out to our sister Navy Yard uh, up in Boston, the Charlestown Navy Yard, uh, which is where these images come from. Um, the image up at the top is basically how you would fix a ship that was in the water before the advent of dry docks. This is called a heaving down. So essentially what you do is you remove all the rigging and maybe part of the mast, and you roll that ship over. Sometimes it might be used by people pulling ropes. In this case, uh, they're using a capstan uh, to turn and pull that ship over. Uh, and then when that half of the hull is exposed, you go along the side and you you know, fix any holes, repaint, whatever you need to do, uh, or uh, defoul, uh, basically getting all the barnacles and marine life off of there that could show, slow the ship down. Um, the other way you could do this is by beaching the ship during low tide. Um, and so then you could roll it over and work on one side and then wait for the tide uh, to come in and then go out again and roll it over the other way. So all of these methods of heaving down are, are very time consuming uh, and very dangerous. Um, but the fact is that a lot of these wooden ships, they, they didn't last all that long. And so it didn't really matter that much. But as ships became larger and larger and more sophisticated, you wanted them to last longer. Uh, and so dry docks were developed to take them out of the water more efficiently and more completely. So this is a floating dry dock. So you can see, basically, this is a barge and it, it's, a, it's U-shaped. So it has those two big uh, compartments along the side. Those are flooded so that the whole U-shape sinks down below the water and you position the ship over it and then you pump the water out of those compartments and it lifts itself up as well as the whole ship. And in some cases, a very, very large ship. This is the floating dry dock that used to be right next to the Brooklyn Army Terminal at the foot of 56th Street at the Morse Dry Dock in, uh, in South Brooklyn. Um, I think we have another picture of a modern day dry dock. The Morse dry dock was made of wood. Uh, this is made out of steel. This comes from uh, another large shipyard in the region, uh, which is the Cadell dry dock on the North shore of Staten Island. Uh, this is where a lot of barges get repaired, where a lot of the Staten Island ferries get repaired. Um, and we did a program uh, uh, several weeks ago where we talked about it because it's where they repaired uh, and did a beautiful restoration of the South Street Seaports um, really signature ship, the Waver Tree. Um, so, so there you can see it. Um, so you're actually looking at basically two vessels here. You're looking at the, the floating dry dock itself, and then you're looking at the barge uh, sitting on top of it. So these are floating dry docks. So 
you know, historically they've been smaller uh, than graving docks. Um, they're obviously, uh, you know, there's only so much that they can lift out of the water, although now we have absolutely massive, massive floating dry docks. Uh, but historically a graving dock was usually a little bit bigger um, for bigger capacity. Um, and so I wanna tell you about the construction of this one right here. Uh, so Cindy has a picture here that will show us the, uh, show us the construction. Um, so this, they started building this in 1841. And when this was ordered by the Navy, um, it was just the third um, naval graving dock in the country. They'd already built one uh, in Norfolk, Virginia, and also one in, uh, in Boston. Um, but this would be the third one, and it would be the largest one. So again, ships are getting bigger and bigger, so we need bigger and bigger uh, repair facilities to accommodate them. Um, the challenge of building it here in Brooklyn uh, and in this location along the Wallabout Bay is basically everything that is the Navy Yard today is, uh, was marshland. So the soil here is very sandy. The water table is very high. The bedrock is very, very deep. And so to build essentially a giant granite bathtub on essentially quicksand um, was a huge engineering challenge. And so for that reason, it took 10 years to build. Um, and in this, um, I just lost the image for a second here, Sen. Um, but in this image, you can see them actually constructing it. This was taken about halfway through the construction in 1846. Um, and it shows, um, you know, the progress, but uh, the progress was quite slow. It was much more expensive than they thought it would be. It ended up costing um, uh, uh, two million dollars when they originally apportioned about fifty thousand uh, dollars for it for its construction. Um, so it was a, a little bit of a white elephant. But when it was built, um, it was the largest dry dock, uh, the dry dock in the Navy, and it would remain really the only dry dock here for another thirty years. Um, until uh, we built dry dock two and then three and four. Um, and then dry docks five and six, which we'll talk about in a minute, um, weren't built until the second world war. Um, so today at the Navy Yard, we still use dry dock one, the oldest one, and five and six, the two newest ones. So I explained to you a little bit about how a floating dry dock works. Now let's take a look at how a graving dock works. Um, so essentially, the first thing you need to do is figure out what ship you're going to put in it. And you need to erect a cradle that the ship is going to sit in. And we're going to see some images here that show not dry dock one, but actually dry dock six um, and what that cradle uh, looks like. So these are all these blocks you see. And you can see the workers way down there, you know, 45 feet down in dry dock, uh, dry dock six. Um, and they are... Uh, they are putting in place what are called keel blocks. Um, so keel blocks are these big concrete blocks uh, with wooden tops on them. And so they form this cradle um, that will conform to the ship that you're gonna put in place. So whatever ship you're gonna move in, you need to specially arrange um, the keel blocks uh, to accommodate it. Um, so that's the first step. The second step is now you're gonna flood this basin. Um, so this is what, uh, dry dock one looks like when it's completely flooded. So we have a whole series of pumps here. Um, and I'll, I'll turn the, the camera around so you can see them a little bit better. Um, the next step is you open the door. So here you can see this is called the caisson or the dry dock door. Um, and it's essentially hollow. It floats. And so what keeps it in place? There's no hinge to it. It doesn't swing open. Uh, it, in fact, is sort of stuck in there like a cork. And what's hold, what holds it in place is the pressure of the water from the outside sort of pushes it into a groove. Um, and then the water, the downward pressure of the water that fills that caisson puts it into this notch um, that's built into the stonework. So here you can see it's actually bobbed up a bit because they pump the water out of it. So it comes out of that groove. They push it to the side. And now we have a channel we can drive the boat into. Then we'll pull the door shut and then pump the water out. So here you can see the pumps uh, working away uh, to get the water uh, out of the dry dock. And then once that water is fully pumped out, the dry dock will settle down into those keel blocks. Here, this is a great view of the caisson. Um, so the dry dock itself dates back to 1851. Uh, the caisson 
uh, dates back to 1905. And here you can see it actually under construction. So you can see the shape of it. Um, so you can see it's sort of uh, narrow at the edges and fat in the middle. Um, it's essentially like a big boat sort of turned sideways. Um, and uh, you can see these holes in it as well that are used for pumping the water uh, in and out of it. So this, uh, this photo is from 1905 and, and shows the replacement uh, caisson that we still use today. It was replacing um, the, wooden, the wooden caisson. The other thing you can see is behind it is the actual caisson of dry dock number, uh, I believe this is dry dock number three um, that this was constructed in. Uh, but you can also see those holes. Um, and just behind that wall is the wall of water of the East River. Um, so that's the basic mechanics of how it works. So I'm gonna turn uh, my camera around here so you can get a better look at the whole thing. Um, I apologize, we don't have a ship in the dry dock today, but that's actually okay because you can get a nice look at the really, really beautiful stonework um, of this structure. So first off, we can see the caisson uh, right there and you can also see uh, the pump. So this black and yellow pipe uh, is the pump um, system for pumping the water out. Now, historically, there was a under uh, pipes uh, that pumped the water sort of from the um, out of the out of the dry dock. Um, the issue is that the pump well and all the equipment that controlled it was destroyed in Hurricane Sandy, so it all became inundated with salt water. Um, just a couple of years ago, the, the Navy Yard actually got funding from FEMA to start to restore those original pump wells. So we've had these temporary pumps here uh, for uh, you know, now about eight years, um, which is pretty, pretty remarkable. Uh, but the dry dock is you know, kept on working away. Um, the other thing you'll notice is that it's pretty low tide. Um, normally, if the tide is a little bit higher, we'd be seeing a little bit of water spilling out. Um, between the gap and, of the, uh, the caisson and the dry dock wall. But you can also see a little bit of water coming out because there's always sump pumps running um, to keep the bottom of the dry dock dry. Um, I'm gonna get to the ferries that are in the background in just a second because we'll talk about the rest of the working waterfront here at the yard. But I just wanna show you the rest of the dry dock here. And if anybody has any questions, please feel free to drop them into the comments. So one thing you can see is the crane. Um, it's a common misconception at the Navy Yard that the cranes don't work, that they're just for show, kind of like the cranes at the Ikea in Red Hook. Our cranes work, and so they still use this crane to put in place those keel blocks. Um, and we have a number of other cranes over at Dry Docks 5 and 6. And then you can yeah. see some, some of the keel blocks uh, down in the bottom of the, uh, of the dry dock, um, maybe for a future, uh, future job. Um, or maybe a job that was just completed. Yeah, so we have some questions here. Hi, Andrew. Yeah, go ahead, Sin. <laughs> um, so good to see you. I'm here at home, everybody. Um, Andrew and I are a couple, <laughs> and we also work together <laughs> at Turnstile, but we just, we have a couple of comments, not necessarily questions. One is uh, sure. Andrea said she really loves to visit uh, the Brooklyn Navy Yard and, and um, learn about the history and also its future. And Tim mentions that his mother was a welder at the Navy Yard and worked on the USS Missouri. Oh, awesome. Yeah, so we, we've been so lucky over the years to meet so many veterans from World War II and defense workers. Um, and also, of course, we have a wonderful oral history collection um, from World War II and especially from women in World War II. So. Uh, that collection is in part housed here at the Brooklyn Navy Yard Archive, um, but a good portion of the collection is actually housed at the Center for Brooklyn History, formerly known as the Brooklyn Historical Society, but has now been merged um, with the Brooklyn Public Library. Uh, and so they have just announced, like last week, um, that their Brooklyn Navy Yard collection is now fully available online. So you can listen to all those interviews uh, as well as read uh, the transcripts so they're searchable. Um, so it's a really fantastic uh, resource. So you can go and, and learn about uh, and, and listen to the voices uh, of the men and women that were here in World War II from the comfort of your own home. So that's really, really exciting. Uh, was there one other comment, Sin? Nope, that's everything for now. Oh, great, okay. Um, yeah, so, so that's the kind of the basics of, of the dry dock. Now, what kind of ships do we get here? Um, now, 
Dry Dock 1 is pretty small. It's about 350 feet long or so. Um, and so what we're typically working on here are the kinds of boats you actually might see going up and down the East River all the time. Tugboats, barges, and ferries. That's the typical thing we work on here. Um, so tug and barge traffic is incredibly important in New York. Uh, we rely on it for basically if you put gas in your car, if you put home heating oil in your house, if you frankly go to the bathroom, if you throw out a piece of garbage, all that stuff at some point was on a barge. Uh, and so we need places to repair them because our waterways here in New York are really like the highways for all of our infrastructure. Um, and that also includes things like construction. Any construction that's anywhere near, a water, near the water, you're probably gonna need a barge. Um, so it's a, it's a really big industry. You know, we're the largest gasoline port in the country. All that gasoline winds up on a barge at some point. Um, all the home heating oil that goes up into New England um, or up into uh, the Hudson Valley, you know, that starts here in New York. So uh, the tugboats and the barges are critical, and this is a really important facility for repairing them here. Cindy's going to pull up another uh, customer we've had here at the Navy Yard. Um, this is actually the um, Port Jefferson Bridgeport Ferry. This is the PT Barnum. Um, We've had you know, a few ferries from other parts of the country come here. We had one uh, that goes across the Delaware Bay come a couple years ago, um, and this one from Long Island Sound. Um, this year, they probably would have preferred that this didn't come here, though. This was a couple years ago when the ferry got pushed by wind uh, into the dock, uh, and it severely damaged the propeller. And so it had to come here for emergency repairs and was out of service for two weeks, which is you know, really bad for the people that live in central Long Island because they're so dependent upon the ferry, um, you know, uh, to go back and forth uh, to New England. So um, that, was a, that was a big job. Um, this is one of the many, many Coast Guard cutters that we have uh, coming to the yard. Um, you know, the Coast Guard is an aging fleet. A lot of the ships are 30, even 40 plus years old, and some of them are now over 50 years old. Uh, and so uh, they basically will repair them anywhere they can find space in a dry dock um, to extend their service life. Uh, so this, I believe, was the, uh, if I'm not mistaken, this is the Seneca. They painted over its hull number because uh, they did a full paint job uh, and everything on it. Uh, but yeah, this is a full service shipyard. So they do structural work, engine work, electrical work, uh, as well as, you know, just your basic uh, painting and, and uh, inspections. Dry do ships need to be dry docked. Um, every few years uh, as part of their mandated Coast Guard inspection. So Coast Guard cutters are here all the time. So even though we don't have any military presence here anymore, uh, members of the Coast Guard are in and out of the yard uh, all the time. Um, I just wanted to mention something about the other, uh, other two dry docks that we have here. Sin, if you could pull up some of those pictures. Um, it'll just take a second. So essentially, I'm gonna turn my camera around again. So you can see the other side of the yard. Um, so again, here's dry dock one, and we'll get the sun out of everybody's face too. Uh, okay, so as we're look, we're now looking east, and you can see a couple of buildings. Um, on the right edge of the frame, you can see building 77. So that's a World War II era building that recently underwent a $200 million renovation. Uh, and now that's where our food manufacturing hub is. So that's a, a public space. You can come and visit Russ and Daughters and Transmitter Brewing. Uh, in the center of the image is uh, Dock 72, which is a new office building uh, that just opened uh, a little over a year ago. Um, and then, uh, so Cindy's pointing them out on the map here. Thank you, Cindy. Uh, and then beyond that, you can see, uh, first of all, at the foot of Dock 72 is our ferry landing. So that's also open to the public. So you can take the Astoria Route Ferry. Uh, and we have a guide to the Astoria Route Ferry as well on our uh, OHNY page, uh, which you can see right there. So you can download that, ride the ferry, and, and read along as you go, um, see some of the landmarks along the way. Um, and then behind that, you can see this black and red vessel. So these are some big ocean going barges. Uh, that we have here at the yard, and they're blocking our view of the cranes. Um, so all the sort of forest of cranes we have here at the Navy Yard, those are all surrounding dry docks five and six. Um, so, dry, so dry dock one is about 350 feet long. Dry docks five and six, we can see this image here, they're each 1,000 
92 feet long. These are large enough to accommodate a modern nuclear powered aircraft carrier. Uh, the challenge of getting an aircraft carrier in here though is uh, number one, uh, we need to do some dredging. Uh, the the uh, bay here is not deep enough to bring one in, uh, but more significantly, uh, it couldn't fit under the Brooklyn Bridge or the Manhattan Bridge. Um, so that was actually one of the contributing factors to the decision to close the Brooklyn Navy Yard uh, was uh, the low bridges that blocked uh, the entrance uh, into the wall about bay. Andrew, As, uh, yeah. Oh, I was gonna say, we have a question from Vic asking how many ships pass through the dry docks on an average week, do you think? Oh, on an average week, you know, one. So a job here might take anywhere from, you know, several days to several months. Um, you know, we had a ship that was in here was it two years ago of the um, National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration. Um, and that was here for over 100 days. Uh, same thing for a couple of Coast Guard cutters. So it might take months. You know, if we're fully at capacity, though, you know, you could fit one vessel in dry dock one. Uh, and sometimes dry docks five and six might each have two or three vessels inside of them. Um, so it can be a lot. It just really depends on uh, the jobs uh, that the operator GMD ship repair uh, depends on what jobs that they get. Um, and Andrew, just a few comments here. Uh, also along the lines of uh, women working at the yard during World War II, Linda mentions that the Navy Yard was prominently featured in Manhattan Beach by Jennifer Egan, who was kind enough to come to her book club to discuss it. So that's very nice. That's, and, that's so awesome. I just, yeah. wanted to, I just wanted to mention something about that. So we did, we did a virtual program uh, uh, with Jenny back in May, which was so much fun. Um, but, you know, we haven't yet relaunched our in-person tours of, of the Navy Yard, you know, during the pandemic. Um, but the last tour I gave of the Navy Yard was actually a tour that I co-led uh, with Jennifer Egan about the book, which was, which was so much fun. Um, so this is actually the first time I've done any kind of, you know, in-person, you know, I've done a lot of programs about the Navy Yard. This is the first time I've done a virtual program from the Navy Yard since I did that tour back with uh, Jennifer in, in March. Uh, so yeah, it's, it's uh, you know, it's kind of melancholy to be back. It's, it's uh, yeah, it's been a long time since I give the, given the tour and I've literally had thousands and thousands of people standing here at the dry dock with me <laughs> sharing the story. So um, thanks so much for pulling this up, Cindy. So here we can see dry dock number five. Um, so again, you can see the scale of just how big it is. And I think we have a picture that actually has a ship in it. There you go. Um, so this is uh, some ships that were here last year, uh, which were some ships of the um, National Defense Reserve Fleet. So these are basically mothballed cargo ships. You can also see these big piles of dirt uh, right here. So like I said, the, the water here is pretty shallow. So whenever they open the dry dock door uh, into dry docks five and six, a lot of silt comes in and that silt builds up over time. Uh, and so before they can dispose of it, it all needs to be um, you know, moved out and then tested and packaged and disposed of uh, properly. So it builds up over time, but then they, they get rid of it. Uh, yeah, so you can see a closer look and you can see the workers down there, just how small they look. Um, scrape in the bottom of, of that ship. And then um, before we go, I know we're just about out of time. And, and again, thank you so much to everybody for joining us and asking your questions. Uh, we have a few historical images uh, that we'll take a look at. So you can see, you know, how the uh, naval architecture here has evolved over time. Um, I'll just mention, uh, oh, here we go. Great. So this is dry dock number four. So here you can see a battleship here. This is uh, the USS New York. This is 1913. Um, dry dock four was the first sort of, um, you know, it was, it was a very, very large dry dock that was built specifically for accommodating battleships. That was also a challenging one to build. It took about seven years to build between 1905 and 1912 because of the challenging geography of the yard. Um, this is a cool picture. This is also, uh, this is dry dock five. Um, this shows uh, two ships, the USS Menges and the USS Holder. 
uh, both damaged in torpedo attacks in the Mediterranean. Uh, one lost a forward section, the other lost a rear section. So they cut the two in half and, and stuck the two halves together. So you can see that that's the process. You can see the little seam um, down the middle of the holder on the right hand side. Um, so they just put those, stuck them together and, and welded them together and that ship went back into service as the USS Menges. Because about 60% of the hull uh, came from the Menges and the rest from the holder. Um, and then, you know, we don't historically haven't just used dry docks for, um, for repair. They've also been used for construction. So here we can see in dry dock five, the construction of the USS uh, Constellation. This photo comes from 19, uh, this is 1959 or 1960. And of course, uh, Constellation, a very famous ship built at the Brooklyn Navy Yard, in, in part because there was a terrible fire that broke out on it uh, in December 1960 uh, and killed 50 workers, which was the worst accident in the history of the yard. Um, so we actually have a memorial plaque here. And a couple of years ago, we had the opportunity to host the Alumni Association of the Constellation, including a number of people that were on the ship uh, during the fire um, and some family members of, of the workers who were killed. Um, so that was really special. So if you come by Building 92, the museum here at the yard and the front gate is open, um, step inside and, and take a look at the memorial plaque. Uh, it was really, really special. So we rededicated it uh, with, the, um, with the Alumni Association who paid to have a replica of the original plaque that was on the ship with all the 50 names um, made. Yeah, Sin. Yeah, um, we have a, a comment from um... Tim, who's been joining us today, who mentioned how much he enjoyed coming on a tour with us a few years ago. In fact, he was on my tour. <laughs> oh, nice. <laughs> and, uh, and he also said um, that his mother has a tribute tile in the courtyard entrance to Building 92 since you had just awesome. that. So I just that's, thought that was a nice connection to that's share. That's so nice. Yeah, of course, because the plaque is actually part of our tribute wall. So, um, you know, the museum uh, and we've commemorated visions of, of many people um, who worked and served here at the Brooklyn Navy Yard or in the sea services in general. Um, so that's, that's, that's a really nice thing to, to check out. So I always encourage people to go take a look at that because people don't always see it. It's right inside the courtyard on the uh, fence that's on the left hand uh, side. Um, and so again, you can check out our guide uh, to the perimeter of the Navy Yard so you can see uh, what other uh, places you can check out around the neighborhoods. One last thing I want to show, excuse my hand, um, is just a couple of the other working waterfront facilities we have here. Um, so one I mentioned before uh, is um, NYC Ferry. So we have a ferry stop here for the Astoria route. We also have the home port. So this is really a shipyard actually. You can see uh, what's called a travel lift. So that's how they lift the uh, ferries out of the water. It's sort of that gray and uh, blue-green colored um, structure. It almost looks like a table sticking up there. Um, so they actually just use that. It has straps and they pick the ships out of the, pick the uh, ferry boats out of the water um, so they can do maintenance on them. It's a little bit easier to do because they're all made out of aluminum. So they're, they're pretty light. Um, but yeah, so whenever a ferry is done with its route, this is where it comes. This is like the, the bus depot for all the ferries. And this is where they get you know, fueled, get provisioned, they pick up their crews. It all happens here, but you have to go across the bay over here to the foot of Dock 72, where you can actually board the ferry as a member of the public. Um, one other working waterfront thing I wanna mention um, is, again, if you've ridden to the ferry, you may have seen this, um, but we have all of these uh, piles of gravel at the end of this pier. Um, that all comes in by ship. So we have a couple companies here, Lehigh Cement and New York Sand and Stone um, that import gravel for, for making, um, making concrete. Uh, so we have ships that come in a couple times a month uh, to deliver all this aggregate uh, material. Uh, and then as Cindy mentioned, you might be able to just see the edge of it, but we have another travel lift over on the far side of the, uh, of the bay. Um, and you can maybe see that make out the edge of a red building. I just don't want to fall into the dry dock. Um, but that is the FDNY's Marine 6. Um, so one of the harbor units of the New York Fire Department 
uh, is also based here at the yarn. So we have a lot of you know working waterfront facilities here and hundreds of people that work in the yard still work in the maritime industry. Now for everybody else, 99% of everything that's made in the yard um, you know, comes in and out of here by truck. Um, so uh, some of the other industries that we have here, you know, we're really um, built around manufacturing. So we have woodworkers, metal workers. Um, you know, we have a lot of companies that work in the garment industry, uh, making clothing, making accessories. Um, and then we have a lot of, you know, artists, um, people making smaller, um, smaller works, but some doing works on, on larger scale um, that are here in the yard. Um, and I should mention that the mask that I'm wearing here, this is actually manufactured in the yard. A lot of the companies here really um, mobilized uh, to help with the production of uh, personal protective equipment at the height of the pandemic, and many of them are still doing it. Just as an example, we have Kings County Distillery, a whiskey distillery. They started making hand sanitizer. My mask here comes from Cry Precision, which is a manufacturer of um, camouflage and protective gear for the military. Uh, and they started making masks. Um, other companies have been making hospital gowns. Another company called Bednark, um, they actually build out um, interiors of retail stores. Um, they took all their fabrication equipment and started making face shields when it was so hard to get you know, N95 masks for essential workers. So the yard was really mobilized in an incredible way um, to help at the height of the pandemic and really showed the value of having local manufacturing, uh, how important it is to have that and um, how quickly they were able to adapt. You know, we also have a lot of high tech industries here, including a place called New Lab, where about 170 companies, you know, work together, collaborate, uh, share equipment. Um, and so it's, a, it's really a, a platform for scaling these companies that are working in really cutting edge uh, technologies. And, and some of those companies were working on um, you know, making new designs for ventilators as well. So, um, you know, you can see more of the different companies that are here at the yard. I, I can't do them all justice because again, there's more than 450, but uh, you can go to the Brooklyn Navy Yard's website and see the tenant directory, but also um, go to the, um, uh, if you go to programs and events, uh, you can find a page that has um, all of the live programs uh, they're doing today, but also they've recorded dozens of videos um, with tenants over the last couple of weeks in partnership with uh, Made in NYC. Um, so you can uh, check those out and see inside some of those spaces uh, as well. Again, apologies for the sun. Okay, so we are now really out of time, but I just wanted to mention a couple of things that we have coming up. Um, so we mentioned this already, but please uh, visit our website, turnstiletours.com slash OHNY, and you can download our map guide to the East River, um, and you can also download our map guide to the perimeter of the Navy Yard. So you can see where you can check out things like Building 77, uh, the Kings County Distillery, visit the Naval Cemetery Landscape, um, which is a beautiful space on the Williamsburg side uh, of the yard. Um, as well as, you know, our nearby parks, including Commodore Berry Park and Fort Greene Park. Um, and then uh, we have some more upcoming programs. So tomorrow, we're doing another OHNY live event at 10.30 a.m. The Prospect Park Waterways, we're going to go inside the 1869 Well House, um, which is uh, now a um, composting bathroom, uh, but we'll learn all about how it works. Then we'll follow, follow the water course of Prospect Park, which is really a remarkable piece of engineering. Um, and then, you know, in addition to these programs we do for OHNY, we've been doing over 150 programs over the course of the pandemic. Um, and so we um, are going to be doing, our next one is going to be on Tuesday. We've done a whole series of programs about the story of Thai cuisine in America, working with some of the best Thai chefs. And so they're uh, cooking shows, they're, you'll learn about ingredients and recipes. Um, so uh, go to our website and you can check those out. It's turnstiletours.com slash Thai food, all one word. Um, but our last episode is gonna be on Tuesday, but you can watch the recordings. On Saturday, uh, we're gonna have agronomist uh, Bob Leiby. He's gonna teach you everything you ever want to know about potatoes. Uh, and then on the 30th, uh, we're gonna have uh, a 
veteran of the Port Authority talk to us all about rail freight in New York Harbor. And so that's going to be an awesome program. So as you can see, one of the things that the uh, pandemic has allowed us to do is actually reach out and do programs with people that we wouldn't normally be able to do in-person guided tours with. Uh, and so it's been really amazing to connect with all these new partners and have all these guests. Uh, and so if you want to enjoy the past work we've done as well as the, our future virtual programs, which we're going to keep doing, uh, you can become a member. Um, so we really appreciate your support. Uh, we have three different levels of membership that give you access to our live programs uh, as well as selections of our recorded programs. We also do uh, member happy hours. We do trivia. Uh, we do special members only content on our website, um, but we really, really appreciate your support. Like so many small businesses, especially in the tourism industry, you know, uh, it's been a hard road for the last seven months, but we wouldn't have made it without our support. And we know we already have a lot of our supporters who are watching online today. So thank you so much, everybody. Thank you so much to Cindy um, for being behind the scenes and, and helping me pull off this um, you know, live broadcast from the middle of an industrial park. Um, but, but thank you so much, everybody. Cindy, anything else you want to add? Yeah, so there's a, um, I just noticed a comment from the audience about someone who's now really interested about visiting the Brooklyn Navy Yard. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we, there's definitely that map, um, but I, I don't know if you wanted to respond to that. Um, yeah, so the Navy they, Yard is- They might want to do um, yep. when they come. Sure, so I'll, I'll just, uh, important, important thing to note is that you know the navy yard a lot of the areas of the facility including here like the shipyard are not open to the public um, and so uh, the yard has worked really hard over the last several years to make more places around the perimeter um, open to the public so you can come and visit um, oh sorry but you won't you won't be able to visit dry dock number one um, but you can um, you know, Building 92 is, is starting to reopen. Building 77 has been open. The Naval Cemetery landscape is really a remarkable space. Uh, and then of course you can uh, stop by the Wegmans, uh, which is inside uh, the Navy Yard. Um, as of right now, we are not relaunching tours of the yard. We hope to at some point in the future. Um, but you know, the number one priority for the Navy Yard is really supporting the businesses that are here. And a lot of them, of course, uh, have, have been struggling. Uh, and then, of course, you know, we still have um, issues um, with spikes in COVID here in, in Brooklyn and other places in the country. But, um, you know, we just want to be really uh, respectful of the thousands of people that work here um, and make sure we're doing things um, that, are, that are safe for everybody. Uh, and we're just not ready at this moment um, to bring groups, even small groups of people into the yard. But sign up for our newsletter, follow us on social media, and you'll be the first to sign out find out uh, when we do relaunch our tours. And on a related note, Ethan wonders, what's the name of the company that made your mask? And also where can people get masks if they'd like to purchase one that's made inside the Navy Yard? Okay, so first thing I'll just say, um, full disclosure, this is, I modified this mask. I wear glasses, so most masks like do not work for me uh, because, um, they fog up my glasses. So I did actually sew this metal bar in here. So if you buy it uh, off the shelf, it won't have that, just so you know. But it is a very, very nice mask. It's got a nice filter in it and stuff. Um, but this comes from Cry Precision, C-R-Y-E. And if you want to get uh, one of these masks or one of the other masks made by yard uh, tenants, you can go inside Building 77 and they have a vending machine of PPE. So you can get your Kings County Distillery uh, hand sanitizer, you know, and you can get, uh, you can get handmade masks there as well. Uh, I also noticed that there is one of those, um, uh, there is one of those um, vending machines as well on Governor's Island. Um, so if you're on Governor's Island, it's right off Colonel's Row. Uh, you can find, find one of them. Um, but yeah, anything else in? No, I think that's, Great. I think that's so, about it. Um, yeah. We just like to encourage people um, to watch the, um, if you're interested in learning more about the Navy Yard, Kings County Distillery is going to be hosting a live uh, whiskey tasting and program at 5 p.m. Um, yeah. You're a Navy Yard tenant. So we hope you'll continue the day and um, all of the Open House New York festivities with the Brooklyn Navy Yard. 
and you can find that right on their Facebook page. So if you're on, you're on Facebook right now, so just go up and search Kings County Distillery, uh, give them a like, and then their live video will pop up there uh, right at five o'clock. And again, uh, go to brooklynnavyyard.org um, and click on um, uh, programs and events, and you can see the full uh, listing of um, Open House New York uh, programs um, that are recorded uh, that you can also watch to take a peek inside, you know, dozens of different facilities here. All right. Well, thank you so much, everybody. Thank you for all the great questions. If you have any more questions, feel free to reach out to us, you know, on social media, or you can send us an email at info at Um And uh, thanks so much. And hopefully we'll see you tomorrow morning at 1030 a.m. for our tour of Prospect Park.